Hello, and thanks for coming. I'm Jamil Jaffer. I'm the director of the ACLU's National Security Project. The documents you're going to you're going to hear tonight are all official government documents, or almost all of them are official government documents. Um, some of them were made public through the Freedom of Information Act. Some of them were leaked to the media, but 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 almost all of them are official government documents. And I think that. Um, that it's remarkable how much information has already been released. We've got the interrogation directives in which Secretary Rumsfeld authorized methods that were once characterized as war crimes. Uh, we have the, the memo, the, direct, the presidential directive in which President Bush uh, denied prisoners the protections of the Geneva Conventions. We've got the legal memos in which the Justice Department lawyers essentially gutted the torture statute. And so it's remarkable how much has been released, but I think it's even more remarkable how little has been done about the facts that we now know to be true. After the abuses of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Congress convened the Church Committee to look into the roots of the problem, to recommend reforms, to create a public record. There hasn't been that kind of response this time around. There is a criminal investigation. The Justice Department initiated a criminal investigation. But the investigation looks at interrogators who went beyond the limits. It doesn't look at the senior officials uh, and the lawyers who set the limits in the first place. Some of you may have seen that a couple of weeks ago, the Justice Department's ethics office uh, released a scathing review of the lawyers who wrote those memos. At the same time, it released a document that essentially overrules the ethics office's report and concludes that the lawyers were guilty of nothing more than poor judgment. I think that you can decide for yourselves whether poor judgment is a fair characterization of what they did. And that, in a way, is the point of this evening. The point is to allow you to, to hear the documents for yourselves uh, and make your own decisions. Um, look at all the documents that were once secret and make your own decisions. I wanted to say just one thing about secrecy. All of this information that was once secret, you know, the, the Bush administration fought very hard uh, to keep this information uh, secret, all this information about gross human rights abuses that were perpetrated in the name of national security. And there were many Americans who fought against that secrecy, uh, and many Americans who fought against the policies that were being kept secret. But I think it's important to acknowledge that we didn't always ask all the questions we should have asked, that in many instances we didn't ask and the government didn't tell. And the consequence is that we were kept in the dark by virtue of our own action or inaction. And in a way, secrecy became not a tool that the government used against the people, but instead a tool that the people used to, to, to keep themselves from the information uh, and maybe to keep themselves from the moral burden of the information. But we now know all of these facts. We now know what's in these documents. And I think we have a responsibility not just to grapple with cells from the grapple maybe to keep cells from the burden of information. But we know all of these facts. We now know these documents. We have a responsibility not just to grapple with cells from the information. Maybe to keep cells from the burden of information. But we want to know all of the six. We now know the six documents. The six ever respond to the six, not just to the six cells from the six. The six may be to keep the six cells from the six burden of the six nation. But we know the least. All of the leaks. We now know the least documents. The leak of a response. The leak not just to the leak cells from the leak. The leak may be to keep the leak cells from the leak. The burden of the leak. The nation. But no, all of the leaks. We now know. These documents give a response, even not just to give cells from the division. Maybe to give cells from the burden of the information. But we know all of the methods. We now know the give a response, not just to give cells from the government. Maybe to give cells from the burden of the but that is that is all of that is we now know that is document that ever respond that is not just to that is cells from the motion maybe to keep more cells from the burden of the motion but we know all of these more we now know these more document these ever respond not just to cells from the motion hello maybe to for coming cells from the
certain male Japanese to the AC. All of the so we now know, we know these documents have a response not just to cells from the corruption, maybe to keep cells from the burden of corruption. But we know all of so we now know these documents have a response not just to cells from the corruption, maybe to keep cells from the burden of corruption. But we know all of so we now know. These documents give a response not just to cells from the ocean, maybe to cells from the burden of information. But no, all of so we now know these documents give a response not just to cells from the ocean, maybe to cells from the burden of information. But no, all of so we now know these documents give a response not just to cells from the Maybe to cells from the burden of information. But no, all of so we now know these documents. I'm going to give a response. I'm going not just to I'm going cells from the I'm going I'm going maybe to I'm going cells from the I'm going burden of I'm going I'm going I'm going no is and writ all of and writ so we now know and writ these documents and writ give a response and writ not just to and writ cells from the and writ and writ maybe to and writ cells from the and writ burden station. No, but is but the all of so we now give a response. Give a response. Cells from the not just to action. A B to cells from the burden. But no, all of all of the documents we now never respond. Never respond. Cells from the action. Cells from the A B to burden. No, but but all of so we now never respond. Never respond. Cells from the not just to action. A B to cells from the burden. And written. And written. And written. No. And written. All of. And written. So we now never. And written. Hi, I'm David Cole. I'm going to read from a memo prepared by the CIA and sent to the Department of Justice on December 30th, 2004. The cover letter of the memo reads, Dan, a generic description of the process. Thank you. The purpose of interrogation is to persuade high-value detainees, HVD, to provide threat information and terrorist intelligence in a timely manner, to allow the U.S. government to identify and disrupt terrorist plots, redacted, and to collect critical intelligence on al-Qaeda, redacted. Effective interrogation is based on the concept of using both physical and psychological pressures in a comprehensive, systematic, and cumulative manner to influence HVD behavior to overcome a detainee's resistance posture. The goal of interrogation is to create a state of learned helplessness and dependence conducive to the collection of intelligence in a predictable, reliable, and sustainable manner. For the purpose of this paper, the interrogation process can be broken into three separate phases, initial conditions, transition to interrogation, and interrogation. A, initial conditions. Capture redacted, contribute to the physical and psychological condition of the HVD prior to the start of interrogation. Of these, capture shock and detainee reactions redacted are factors that may vary significantly between detainees. Regardless of their previous environment and experience, once an HVD is turned over to CIA, a predictable set of events occur. One, rendition. A, the HVD is flown to a black site, redacted. A medical, examiner is con a medical examination is conducted prior to the flight. During the flight, the detainee is securely shackled and is deprived of sight and sound through the use of blindfolds, earmuffs, and hoods, redacted. There is no interaction with the HVD during this rendition movement except for periodic direct assessment by the onboard medical officer. B. Upon arrival at the destination airfield, the HVD is moved to the black site under the same conditions and using appropriate security procedures. 2. Reception at black site. The HVD is subjected to administrative procedures and medical assessment upon arrival at the black site. Redacted. 
the HVD finds himself in the complete control of Americans, redacted. The procedures he is subjected to are precise, quiet, and almost clinical, and no one is mistreating him. While each HVD is different, the rendition and reception process generally creates significant apprehension in the HVD because of the enormity and suddenness of the change in environment, the uncertainty about what will happen next, and the potential dread an HVD might have of U.S. custody. Reception procedures include A, the HVD's head and face are shaved. B, a series of photographs are taken of the HVD while nude to document the physical condition of the HVD upon arrival. C, a medical officer interviews the HVD and a medical evaluation is conducted to assess the physical condition of the HVD. The medical officer also determines if there are any contraindications to the use of interrogation techniques. D, a psychologist interviews the HVD to assess his mental state. The psychologist also determines if there are any contraindications to the use of interrogation techniques. Transitioning to interrogation, the initial interview. Interrogators use the initial interview to assess the initial resistance posture of the HVD and to determine, in a relatively benign environment, if the HVD intends to willingly participate with CIA interrogators. The standard on participation is set very high during the initial interview. The HVD would have to willingly provide information on actionable threats and location information on high-value targets at large not lower-level information, for interrogators to continue with this neutral approach. The rest of the page is redacted. Hi, I'm Congressman Bobby Scott, and I'm going to read from an excerpt of a legal memo signed by Assistant Attorney General for the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, Jay Bobby. The August 1, 2002 memo addresses the proposed interrogation of a detainee named Abu Zabeda. And I'm Congressman Keith Ellison, and I'll be reading excerpts from Abu Zabeda's firsthand account of his interrogation in a secret CIA prison. Abu Zubaydah's testimony is included in a report by the International Committee for the Red Cross about the treatment of detainees in U.S. custody. The memo. You have asked for this office's views on whether certain proposed conduct would violate the prohibition against to torture found in Section 2340A of Title 18 of the United States Code. You have asked for this advice in the course of conducting interrogations of Abu Zubaydah in light of the information you believe Zabeda has and the high level of threat you believe now exists, you wish to move the interrogations into what you have, have described as an increased pressure phase. This phase is likely to last no more than several days, but could last up to 30 days. About two and a half or three months after I arrived in this place, the interrogation began again, but with more intensity than before. Then the real torturing started. In this phase, you would like to employ 10 techniques that you would believe will dislocate his expectations regarding the treatment he believes he will receive and encourage him to disclose the crucial information mentioned above. These 10 techniques are, one, attention grasp, two, walling, three, facial hold, four, facial slap, insult slap, Five, cramped confinement. Six, wall standing. Seven, stress positions. Eight, sleep deprivation. Nine, insects placed in a confinement box. And ten, the waterboard. You have informed us that you expect these techniques to be used in some sort of escalating fashion, culminating with the waterboard, though not necessarily ending in this technique. Two black wooden boxes were brought into the room outside my cell. One was tall slightly higher than me and narrow, measuring perhaps one meter by three quarters of a meter and two meters in height. The other was shorter, perhaps only one meter in height. I was taken out of my cell and one of the interrogators wrapped a towel around my neck. They then used it to swing me around and smash me repeatedly against the hard walls of the room. 
I was also repeatedly slapped in the face. As I was still shackled, the pushing and pulling around meant that the shackles pulled in painfully on my ankles. Cramped confinement involves the placement of an individual in a confined, in a confined space, the dimensions of which restrict the individual's movement. The confined space is usually dark. The duration of confinement varies based on the size of the, con of the container. For the larger confined space, the individual can stand up or sit down. The smaller space is large enough for the subject to sit down. Confinement in the larger space can last up to 18 hours. For the smaller space, confinement lasts for no more than two hours. I was then put into the tall box for what I think was about one and a half to two hours. The box was totally black on the outs inside as well as the outside. It had a bucket inside to use as a toilet and had water to drink provided by a bottle. They put a cloth of cover over the outside of the box to cut out the light and restrict my air supply. It was difficult to breathe. For walling, a flexible false wall will be constructed. The individual is placed with his heels touching the wall. The interrogator pulls the individual forward and then quickly and firmly pushes the individual into the wall. It is the individual's shoulder blades that hit the wall. During this motion, the head and neck are supported with a rolled hood or towel that, that provides a sea collar effect to help prevent whiplash. To further reduce the probability of injury, the individual is allowed to rebound from the flexible wall. You have orally informed us that the false wall is in part constructed to create a loud sound when the individual hits it, which will further shock and surprise the individual. In part, the idea is to create a sound that will make the impact seem far worse than it is and that will be far worse than any injury that might result from the action. When I was let out of the box, I saw that one of the walls of the room had been covered with plywood sheeting. From now on, it was against the wall, this wall, that I was then smashed with a towel around my neck. I think the, that the plywood was there to provide some absorption of the impact of my body. The interrogators realized that smashing me against the wall would probably quickly result in physical injury. During these torture sessions, many guards present, plus two interrogators who did the actual beating, still asking questions which the main interrogator left to return when the beating was over. After the beating, I was then placed in a small box. They placed a cloth or cover over the box to cut out all light and restrict my air supply. As it was not high enough to even sit upright, I had to crouch down. It was very difficult because of my wounds. The wound on my leg began to open and started to bleed. I don't know how long I remained in the small box, I think I may have slept or maybe fainted. Finally, you'd like to use the technique called the waterboard. In this procedure, the individual is bound securely to an inclined bench, which is approximately four feet by seven feet. The individual's feet are generally elevated. A cloth is placed over the forehead and eyes. Water is then applied to the, cl uh, to the cloth in a controlled manner. As this is done, the cloth is lowered until it covers the nose and mouth. Once the cloth is saturated and completely covers the mouth and nose, airflow is, is slightly restricted for 20 to 40 seconds due to the presence of the cloth. This causes an increase in carbon dioxide, dioxide level in the individual's blood. This increase in carbon dioxide level stimulates increased effort to breathe. This effort plus the cloth produces a perception of suffocation and incipient panic, i.e. the perception of drowning. During those 20 to 40 seconds, water is continually applied from a height of 12 to 24 inches. After this period, the cloth is lifted and the individual is allowed to breathe unimpeded for three or four full breaths. The sensation of drowning is immediately relieved by the removal of the cloth. The procedure may then be repeated. The water is usually applied from a canteen cup or small watering can with a spout. You have orally informed us that this procedure triggers an automatic physiological sensation of drowning that the individual cannot control, even though he may be aware that he is in fact not drowning. You have also orally informed us that it is likely that this procedure would not last more than 20 minutes in any one application. I was then dragged from the small box, unable to walk properly, and put on what looked like a hospital bed and strapped down very tight with belts. 
A black cloth was then placed over my face, and the interrogators used a mineral water bottle to pour on the cloth so that I could not breathe. After a few minutes, the cloth was removed, and the bed was rotated into an upright position. The pressure of the straps on my wounds was very painful. I vomited. The bed was then again lowered to a horizontal position, and the same torture carried out again with the black cloth over my face and water poured on from a bottle. On this occasion, my head was in a more backward, downward position, and the water was poured on for a longer time. I struggled against the straps, trying to breathe, but it was hopeless. I thought I was going to die. I lost control of my urine. Since then, I lose control of my urine when under stress. In order for pain and suffering to rise to the level of torture, the statute requires it to be severe. Although the confinement boxes, both small and large, are physically uncomfortable because, of their, because their size restricts movement, they are not so small as to require the individual to contort his body to sit, small box, or stand, large box. You have also orally informed us that despite his wounds, a beta remains quite flexible, which would substantially reduce any pain associated with being placed in the box. The facial slap and walling contain precautions to ensure that no pain, even approaching, even approaching severe pain, results. The slap is delivered with fingers slightly spread, which you have explained to us is designed to be less painful than a closed hand slap. The slap is also delivered to the fleshy part of the face, further reducing any risk of physical damage or serious pain. Likewise, walling involves quickly pulling the person forward, then thrusting him against the flexible wall, flexible false wall. You have informed us that the sound of hitting the wall will actually be far worse than any possible injury to the individual. The use of a roll towel around the neck also reduces the risk of, energy, of injury. While it may hurt to be pushed against the wall, any pain experienced is not of the intensity associated with serious physical injury. I was then placed again in the tall box. While I was inside the box, loud music was played again, and somebody kept banging repeatedly on the box from the outside. I tried to sit down on the floor, but because of the small space, the bucket with urine tipped over and spilled over me. I remained in the box for several hours, maybe overnight. I was then taken out, and again, a towel was wrapped around my neck and I was smashed into the wall with a plywood covering and repeatedly slapped in the face by the same two interrogators as before. I was then made to sit on the floor with a black hood over my head until the next session of torture began. As we understand it, the waterboard is used, as we understand it, when the waterboard is used, the subject's body responds as if the subject were drowning, even though the subject may be well aware that he is, in fact, not drowning. You have informed us that this procedure does not inflict actual physical harm. Thus, although the subject may experience the fear or panic associated with the feeling of drowning, the waterboard does not inflict physical pain. As we explained in the Section 2340A memorandum, pain and suffering, as used in Section 2340, is best understood as a single concept, not distinct concepts of pain as distinguished from suffering. The waterboard, which inflicts no pain or actual harm whatsoever, does not, in our view, inflict severe pain or suffering. Even if one were to parse the statute more, more finely, to attempt to treat suffering as a distinct concept, the waterboard could not be said to inflict severe suffering. The waterboard is simply a controlled, acute episode lacking the connotation of a protracted period of time generally given to suffering. This went on for approximately one week. During this time, the whole procedure was repeated five times. On each occasion, apart from one, I was suffocated once or twice and was put in a vertical position on the bed in between. On one occasion, the suffocation was repeated three times. I vomited each time I was put in the vertical position between the suffocation. During that week, I was not given any solid food. I was only given Ensure to drink. My head and beard were shaved every day. I collapsed and lost consciousness on several occasions. Even the torture was stopped by the intervention of the doctor. 
I was told during this period that I was one of the first to receive these interrogation techniques, so no rules applied. It felt like they were experimenting and trying out techniques to be used later on other people. Thank you. I remember being spat at. I remember the dogs being brought so close to me that I could almost feel the saliva dropping off the dog's mouth. I uh, took a knife and ripped off my clothes. I could feel the cold blade gliding across my skin. And then being taken up um, naked, forcibly shaved. I was held for a total of three years. Three years without charge, without trial, without any explanation. Um, and I was released without charge, without trial and without any explanation. We moved and lived in the city of Kabul only for a few months, um, up until September 11th happened. Uh, I was, I think, playing a game on my computer in the middle of the night and just about to go to bed. Uh, the kids and the wife had already gone to sleep. And as I was about to turn in for the night, there was a knock on the door. So I found that very strange. And they stormed in, pushed their way in. And, and one of the guns raised towards my head. I was hooded. And just before they carried me away, I tried to say, please leave my family alone. Prisoner 421. And I remember his number because his back used to be towards me when his hands were tied up. He had slumped, his body had slumped. They had clearly put him there to break him, started punching him and then unshackled him, punching him to see if he was putting it on and then they dragged him away uh, and beat him some more and eventually he was killed. My experience of America prior to this was everything that I'd seen in the films. The concept of the good guys, the concept of um, people trying to do the right thing. And that was shattered. After my experience of Guantanamo, I felt that um, there's a word that, that really encapsulates what I think of American justice, oxymoron. What's really important, I think, for the United States of America, that if it wishes to reach a solution and end the type of arbitrary nature of detention and warmongering that we saw under the Bush era, if people really want to see an end to that, then there needs to be a, a recognition that detention without trial is a fundamental principle that every developed civilized nation should be against. Good evening. I'm Congressman John Conyers, Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. And I'm, I'm reading a speech delivered by President Bush on June 26, 2004, in commemoration of International Day in support of torture victims. Today, on United Nations International Day, in support of victims of torture, the United States reaffirms its commitment to the worldwide elimination of torture. Freedom from torture is an inalienable human right, and we are committed to building a world where human rights are respected and protected by the rule of law. America stands against and will not tolerate torture. We will investigate and prosecute all acts of torture and undertake to prevent other cruel and unusual punishment in all territory under our jurisdiction. American personnel are required to comply with all United States laws, including the United States Constitution, federal statutes, including statutes prohibiting torture, and our treaty obligations with respect to the treatment of all detainees. The United States also remains steadfastly committed to upholding the Geneva Conventions, which have been the bedrock of protection in armed conflict for more than 50 years. 
We expect other nations to treat other service members and civilians in accordance with the Geneva Conventions. Our armed forces are committed to complying with them and to holding accountable those in our military who do not. The American people were horrified by the abuse of detainees at Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. These acts were wrong. They were inconsistent with our policies and our values as a nation. I have directed a full accounting for the abuse of the Abu Ghraib detainees and investigations are underway to review detention operations in Iraq and elsewhere. Despite international efforts to protect human rights around the world, repressive regimes continue to victimize people through torture. The victims often feel forgotten, but we will not forget them. America supports accountability and treatment centers for torture victims. We stand with the victims to seek their healing and recovery and urge all nations to join us in these efforts to restore the dignity of every person affected by torture. These times of increasing terror challenge the world. Terror organizations challenge our comfort and our principles. The United States will continue to take seriously the need to question terrorists who have information that can save lives. But we will not compromise the rule of law or the values and principles that make us strong. Torture is wrong no matter where it occurs, and the United States will continue to lead the fight to eliminate it everywhere. I'm Asif Manvi. I'm uh, going to read from a statement by Khaled al-Misri, Masri, a German citizen of Lebanese descent who was a car salesman before he was detained in December 2003. <clears throat> the U.S. policy of extraordinary rendition has a human face, and it is mine. I was born in Kuwait and raised in Lebanon, in 1985, I fled to Germany in search of a better life. I became a citizen and started my own family. I have five children. On December 31st, 2003, I took a bus from Germany to Macedonia. When we arrived, Macedonian agents conf confiscated my passport and detained me for 23 days. I was not allowed to contact anyone. I was forced to record a video saying I had been treated well. I was handcuffed, blindfolded, and taken to a building where I was severely beaten. My clothes were sliced from my body with a knife or scissors, and my underwear was forcibly removed. I was thrown to the floor, my hands pulled behind me, a boot placed on my back. When my blindfold was removed, I saw men dressed in black wearing ski masks. <clears throat> I was put in a diaper, a belt with chains to my wrists and ankles, earmuffs, eye pads, a blindfold and a hood. I was thrown into a plane, my legs and arms spread eagled and secured to the floor. I felt two injections and became nearly unconscious. I felt the plane take off, land, and take off. When we landed again, I was beaten and left in a dirty and cold concrete cell with a bottle of putrid water. I was taken to an interrogation room where I saw men dressed in the same black clothing and ski masks as before. They stripped and photographed me and took blood and urine samples. I was returned to the cell. The following night, my interrogations began. They asked me if I knew why I had been detained. I did not. 
They told me I was now in a country where no laws, with no laws. And did I understand what that meant? They asked me many times whether I knew the men who were responsible for the September 11th attacks, if I had traveled to Afghanistan, and if I associated with certain people in Germany. I told the truth, that I had never been in Afghanistan and had never been involved in any extremism. I asked repeatedly to meet with a representative of the German government, or a lawyer, or to be brought before a court. My requests were ignored. In desperation, I began a hunger strike. After 27 days without food, I was taken to meet with two Americans, the prison director and another man referred to as the boss. I pleaded with them to release me or bring me before a court, but the prison director replied that he could not release me without permission from Washington. He also said he believed I should not be detained in the prison. After 37 days without food, I was dragged to the interrogation room where a feeding tube was forced through my nose into my stomach. I became extremely ill. I was taken to meet an American who said he had traveled from Washington and who promised I would soon be released. I was also visited by a German-speaking man who explained that I would be allowed to return home but warned that I was never to mention what had happened because the Americans were determined to keep it a secret. Almost five months after I was kidnapped, I was again blindfolded, handcuffed, and chained to an airplane seat. I was told we would land in a country other than Germany, but that I would eventually get to Germany. After we landed, I was driven into the mountains. My captors removed my handcuffs and blindfolded and, blindfolded and told me to walk down a dark, deserted path and not to look back. I was afraid I would be shot in the back. I turned a bend and encountered three men who asked why I was illegally in Albania. They took me to the airport where I bought a ticket home. My wallet had been returned to me. I had long hair, a beard, and had lost 60 pounds. My wife and children had gone to Lebanon believing I had abandoned them. We are now together again in Germany. I still do not know why this happened to me. I've been told that the American Secretary of, Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, confirmed in a meeting with the German Chancellor that my case was a mistake, and that American officials later denied she said that. No one from the American government has ever contacted me or offered me any explanation or apology for the pain they caused me. I experienced sadness in a state that I never have, uh, cruelty in, in a depth that I never seen in my life. But you will not leave a similar person anymore. You will leave as broken, physically broken, psychologically broken wretches. You wouldn't even dream of it or feel it unless you're really subjected to it. I could tell you, you know, just imagine yourself sleeping under light, glaring light for six years. What will that do to you? You could imagine it, but you will not really feel how breaking it is to the mind unless you live underneath that kind of system. When you have a hole like that and then you have an AC which is in full blow of air, cold air coming out into it, you're living inside a fridge. You're locked up. I used to remember, you know, I worked in Burger King's when I was a student for, for studies and stuff. I used to remember walking into Burger King's fridge to get stuff out. It was like that. And they had a system after system, it was continuous. It was like you never had rest in town for six years. They had elastics, goggles were really, really tight. You can see the blood was, you can feel your head blowing up because of the blood was holding, holding back between this area to this area. And um, you had no senses, your nose was covered, your ears were covered, they were very uncomfortable, your hands were like that. And sometimes they drown you with water. This is the closest we came to waterboarding. Is they, they, they do water where you suffocate, they put lots of water until you scream. They spray you with something that makes you really burn everywhere, your face, everything. And they'd be laughing. Sometimes they'd pass and hit you with the electric gun if they wanted, sometimes, and they laugh about that. We were never legally accused of anything. We were subjected to all sorts of barbarian kind of treatment, humiliation, disgrace. 
uh, torture and so on. And we were never, we were released without any charges, without anything, no apologies, nothing. No, that, that doesn't mean that I held grudge against every American. No, I want the people themselves, the humans in America, the good people which I met many of, to realize how in their names those ugly people have done to others. Hi, I'm Matthew Alexander. I'm Susan Shreve. We will be reading excerpts from emails written by FBI personnel reported on the situation at Guantanamo. The emails are dated between October 2002 and July 2004. June 20th, 2003. Subject, survived the first week. Hello. Well, I've survived my first week at Gitmo. We've observed and provided observations and suggestions on seven, or was it eight, interviews in six days. Two yesterday and two the day before anyhow. Many of the interviewers have approached us for help, and in other cases we've asked if we could sit in to see new detainees, etc. And no one has said no yet. Seem to have been well received by most interviewers. Interesting differences between the interviewees as well as interview styles. And definitely areas where I feel we've contributed. We're still hearing about folks doing weird things like subjecting interviewees to strobe lights, etc., but have not seen anything of concern to date. Overheard a very loud non-bureau interview down the hall yesterday, but chose not to observe it. On the personal front, have seen two movies at the outdoor theater, Matrix Reloaded and Bruce Almighty. Definitely a must-see, censored. There's even a monkey scene in it for you. There was a bonfire beach party last Friday and a pool party on Saturday night. We have an offer to go sailing this Sunday. Not sure if going yet. Friday, June 30th, 2004. Subject, get oh, censored. Following a detainee interview, exact date unknown, while leaving the interview, interview building at Camp Delta, at approximately 8.30 p.m. or later, I heard and observed in the hallway loud music and flashes of light. I walked from the hallway into the open door of a monitoring room to see what was going on. From the monitoring room, I looked inside the adjacent interview room. At that time, I saw another detainee sitting on the floor of the interview room with an Israeli flag draped around him loud music being played, and a strobe light flashing. I left the monitoring room immediately after seeing this activity. I did not see any other persons inside the interview room with the Israeli flag draped detainee, but suspect that this was a practice used by the DOD DHS, since the only other persons inside the hallway near this particular interview room were dressed in green military fatigues. I understood prior to deployment to Gitmo that such techniques were not allowed nor approved by FBI policy. Monday, May 10th, 2004. Subject, instructions to Gitmo interrogators. TJ, we did advise each supervisor that went to Gitmo to stay in line with Bureau policy and not deviate from that censored. We had also met with Generals Dunleavy and Miller explaining our position, law enforcement techniques versus DOD. Both agreed the Bureau has their way of doing business and DOD has their marching orders from the SECDEF. In my weekly meetings with DOJ, we often discussed censored techniques and how they were not effective or producing intel that was reliable. One specific example was censored. Once the Bureau provided DOD with the findings censored, they wanted to pursue expeditiously their methods to get more out of him. Censored. We were given a so-called deadline to use our traditional methods. Once our timeline censored was up, censored took the reins. We stepped out of the picture and censored ran the operation. FBI did not participate at the direction of myself, censored, and BAUUC censored. Bottom line is FBI personnel have not been involved in any methods of interrogation that deviate from our policy. The specific guidance we have given has always been no Miranda, Otherwise, follow FBI DOJ policy just as you would in your field office. 
use common sense, utilize our methods that are proven. Saturday, October 26, 2002, subject, Gitmo update. Hello, all. Censored is gone, and I am here. Censored, you made quite an impression and le have left big shoes to fill. First impressions. It is hot here. I brought too much luggage. The learning curve is vertical. The more you read about Islam and our friends here, the better off you will be once you get here. Many different agendas here, and you will have to use all of your behavioral skills to pull it all together and keep your finger on the pulse. No one will lead you by the hand. Did I mention that it is hot here? Later. Monday, July 12th, 2004, subject Gitmo. Mr. Censored. I'm responding to your request for feedback on aggressive treatment and improper interview techniques used on detainees at Gitmo. I did observe treatment that was not only aggressive, but personally very upsetting, although I can't say that this treatment was perpetrated by bureau employees. It seemed that these techniques were being employed by the military, government contract employees, and censored. Friday, December 5th, 2003. Subject, impersonating FBI at Getmo. I am forwarding this EC up the CTD chain of command. MLDU requested this information be documented to protect the FBI. MLDU has had long-standing and documented position against the use of some of DOD's interrogation practices. However, we were not aware of these latest techniques until recently. Of concern, DOD interrogators impersonating supervisory special agents of the FBI told a detainee that censored. These same interrogation teams then censored. The detainee was t also told by this interrogation team, censored. These tactics have produced no intelligence of a threat neutralization nature to date, and CITF believes that techniques have destroyed any chance of pro prosecuting this detainee. If this detainee is released or his story made public in any way, DOD interrogators will not be held accountable because these torture techniques were done by the FBI interrogators. The FBI will be left holding the bag before the public. I'm Alice McDermott. And I'm Jack Rice. We'll be reading excerpts from the interrogation log of Detainee 063. This 83-page documents log logs the minute-by-minute seven-week interrogation of Muhammad al Qatani, which took place from November 2002 through January of 2003 at Camp X-Ray, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. By the way, the first time I read this in Manhattan uh, through the ACLU, I just returned from Gitmo, and I was at Camp X-Ray in these interrogation rooms. 0001. Upon entering the booth, Lead played the call to prayer with a special alarm clock. Detainee was told, this is no longer the call to prayer. You're not allowed to pray. This is the call to interrogation, so pay attention. Both Lead and Control participated in a pride and ego down approach. Control told detainee, Osama bin Laden, UBL, has made a whore of Islam. Since you follow UBL, you also rape, rape Islam. Control put a sign on detainee which had the Arabic word for coward written on it, explained how the words liar, stupid, weak, and failure apply to detainee. Detainee showed very little emotion during the initial portion of the session, except for the occasional smug smile that was met with immediate taunts and ridicule from the interrogators. 0120. Lead ordered detainee to go to bathroom and walk for 20 minutes. Refused water. Corman checked his vital signs and stated he was fine. Both interrogators continued with the futility and pride and ego down approaches. 
On occasion, when the detainee began to drift off into sleep, Lee dripped a couple of drops of water on detainee's head to keep him awake. Detainee jerked violently in his chair each time. 0240. After a bathroom and walking break and detainee's refusal of water, the interrogators continued the aforementioned approaches. Detainee showed little response during this session. Detainee became increasingly tired and incoherent. 0320. Detainee received walking and bathroom break. Refused water. He then slept for one hour, followed by one hour in his chair, listening to white noise. 0530. Control showed detainee the banana rats. By the way, they're about this big. <laughs> and they do exist. And stated that they live better than he does. Lead asked detainee, what do you think is going to happen to you? What would a judge do if he saw all of the information that links you to Al-Qaeda? Detainee stated, I am not associated with Al-Qaeda. After that statement, Control read all circumstantial evidence collected against detainee. Detainee attempted to hide his emotions, but was clearly frightened when asked if the judge had enough evidence to convict him. 0700. Detainee walked, refused water, and allowed to begin four-hour rest period. 1100. Detainee awakened and offered coffee. Refused. 1115. Detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes. Offered water, refused. Interrogators began telling detainee how ungrateful and grumpy he was. In order to escalate the detainee's emotions, a mask was made from an MRE box with a smiley face on it and placed on the detainee's head for a few moments. A latex glove was inflated and labeled the sissy slap glove. This glove was touched to the detainee's face periodically after explaining the terminology to him. The mask was placed back on the detainee's head. While wearing the mask, the team began dance instruction with the detainee. The detainee became agitated and began shouting. The mask was removed and the detainee was allowed to sit. Detainee shouted and addressed Lead as the oldest Christian here and wanted to know why Lead allowed the detainee to be treated this way. 1300. Detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes. 1320. Detainee offered food and water refused. Detainee was unresponsive for remainder of session. Afghanistan Taliban themes run for remainder of session. 1430. Detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes. 1500. Detainee offered water refused. 1510. Corman changes bandages on ankles, checks vitals. Okay. 1530, detainee taken to bathroom and walk 10 minutes. 1600, Corman checks vitals and starts IV. Detainee given three bags of IV. 1745, detainee taken to bathroom and walk 10 minutes. 1800, detainee was unresponsive. 1833, detainee was allowed to sleep. 1925, the detainee was awakened by interrogation team. He was offered food and water but he refused. 1945, the interrogation team and detainee watched the video Operation Enduring Freedom. 2120, detainee was sent to the latrine, offered water, but he refused. 2200, detainee exercised for good health and circulation. Medical representative took detainee's vital signs and removed the IV housing unit from the detainee's arm. The detainee's pulse rate was low, 38, and his blood pressure was high, 144 over 90. Detainee complained of having a boil on his left leg just below his knee. The medical representative looked at the leg and phoned the doctor. The doctor instructed the corpsman to recheck the detainee's vitals in one hour. 2300. Detainee refused water and food. He was taken to the latrine and exercised in order to assist in improving the detainee's vital signs. 2345. The medical representative rechecked the detainee's vital signs. The detainee's blood pressure had improved, but it was still high, 138 over 80, and his pulse rate had improved, but it remained low, 42. The corpsman called the doctor to provide an update, and the doctor said operations could continue since there had been no significant change. It was noted that historically the detainee's pulse sometimes drops into the 40s in the evenings.
I'm Ben Wisner. Alice McDermott and I will be reading an excerpt of former CIA Director George Tenet's appearance on 60 Minutes in April of 2007. Alice will read the part of CBS correspondent Scott Pelley. I'm George Tenet. You know, the image that's been portrayed is we sat around the campfire and said, oh boy, now we get to torture people. We don't torture people. Let me say that again to you. We don't torture people, okay? So... Come on, George. We don't torture people. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? We don't torture people. Waterboarding? We do not... I do not talk about techniques. It's torture. And we don't torture people. Now listen to me. Listen to me. I want you to listen to me. The context is it's post 9-11. I've got reports of nuclear weapons in New York City, apartment buildings that are going to be blown up, planes that are going to fly into airports all over again, plot lines that I don't know. I don't know what's going on inside the United States, and I'm struggling to find out where the next disaster is going to occur. Everybody forgets one central context of what we lived through, the palpable fear that we felt on the basis of the fact that there was so much we did not know. I know that this program has saved lives. I know we've disrupted plots. But what you're essentially saying is some people need to be tortured. I did not say that. I did not say that. You're telling me that... I did that not say that. The enhanced interrogation... I didn't say that. We do not... To Listen to me. Look. Look, you're making an assumption. You call it in the book enhanced interrogation techniques. Well, that's what we call it. I mean, that's a euphemism. I'm not having a semantic debate with you. I'm telling you what I believe. Anybody ever die in the interrogation program? No. You're sure of that? Yeah. In this program that you and I are talking about, no. <laughs> Have you ever seen any of these interrogations done? No. Didn't you feel like it was your responsibility to know what you were signing off on? I understood. I'm not a voyeur. I understand what I was signing off on. I'm Paul Oster, and I will be reading excerpts from a series of autopsy and death reports of detainees who died in U.S. custody in Iraq and Afghanistan. Autopsy number A03-51, date of death June 6, 2003. Decedent is a 52-year-old Iraqi male, civilian detainee, who was found unresponsive outside in isolation at Whitehorse Detainment Facility. This 52-year-old male, redacted, died as a result of asphyxia, lack of oxygen to the brain due to strangulation. Additional findings at autopsy include blunt force injuries, predominantly recent bruises on the torso and lower extremities. The abrasions encircling the left wrist are consistent with the use of restraints. Cause of death, strangulation. Manner of death, homicide. Autopsy number ME03-504. Date of death, November 4th, 2003. An Iraqi national died while detained at the Abu Ghraib prison where he was held for interrogations by government agencies. Fractures of the ribs and a con contusion of the left lung imply significant blunt force injuries of the thorax and likely resulted in impaired respiration. Interviews taken from individuals present during the interrogation indicate that a hood was placed over the head and neck of the detainee. This likely resulted in further compromise of effective respiration. Cause of death, blunt force injuries complicated by compromised respiration. Manner of death, homicide. Autopsy number ME03. Dash 571. Date of death, November 26, 2003. This Iraqi died while in U.S. custody. The details surrounding the circumstances at the time of death are classified. Cause of death, asphyxia due to smothering and chest compression. Manner of death, homicide. Death, April 5, 2004. Location, LSA Diamond. Questioned by NSWT, struggled, interrogated, died sleeping, 
cause and manner pending. Death, January 1, 2004. Location, FOB Rifles. Questioned by, quote, other government agency. Gagged in standing restraints. Cause, blunt force injuries and asphyxia. Manner of death, homicide. Death, November 26, 2004. Location, FOB Tiger. Questioned by, quote, military intelligence. Died during interrogation. Cause, asphyxia due to smothering and chest compression. Manner of death, homicide. Death, November 4, 2003. Location, Abu Ghraib. Questioned by, quote, other government agency and NSWT. Died during interrogation. Cause, blunt force injury complicated by compromised respiration. Manner of death, homicide. Death, December 10, 2002. Location, Bagram, Afghanistan. Found unresponsive in cell. Cause, blunt force injuries to lower extremities. Manner of death, homicide. Death, December 3, 2002. Location, Bagram, Afghanistan. Found unresponsive, restrained in his cell. Cause, pulmonary embolism due to blunt force injuries to the legs. Manner of death, homicide. Autopsy number ME04-14. Date of death, January 9th, 2004. Iraqi detainee died while in U.S. custody. This 47-year-old white male died of blunt force injuries and asphyxia. The autopsy disclosed multiple blunt force injuries, including deep con contusions of the chest wall, numerous displaced rib fractures, lung contusions, and hemorrhage into the intestine. The decedent was shackled to the top of a door frame with a gag in his mouth at the time he lost consciousness and became pulseless. The severe blunt force injuries, the hanging position, and the obstruction of the oral cavity with a gag contributed to this individual's death. The manner of death is homicide. We was getting the chance to go to Afghanistan for like a few days, see the country, then come back. And the day that we arrived in Afghanistan is when the bombing started and it was just we didn't know what was going on we were scared there was bombs being dropped everywhere the first reaction by seeing an American soldier is you know you think basically I'm saved by the bell but which wasn't the case you know the first thing they, t they, they, they took us they stripped us down uh, naked um, and they tied our hands behind our backs a sack was put over our head guards would walk past and kick you and punch you they want answers which you can't give them because you, you have no involvement in anything. And that, that, that kind of mental torture is a hundredfold worse than physical torture because you don't know what's going on. You, you're worried about your family, if they're alive, if they're okay, and you have no contact with them. You're sitting in this cell and w the only thing you can do is start hitting your head off the floor. Throughout our stay in Guantanamo, we all, we was all physically and, and psychologically and sexually abused in many, many forms. I know of detainees who, who went into litigation and they were threatened to be sodomized. I know of, of detainees who went into litigation and came back crying um, because of what had happened to them. You know, they were sexually abused by women and male, by men, interrogators, who would, you know, the women would come onto them. And, and fill them up, you know, sexually. It's hard to understand when you are born in the West. You know, you talk about sexual. You know, when when you talk about women trying to physically touch the male, most people in the West would think, "Well, what's wrong with that?" But you have to you have to take in consideration that where that where is that person from? What is his culture? It wasn't just a conflict between detainees and soldiers. It was between soldiers and soldiers as well. There's one group from Massachusetts that made our life hell a lot worse than anyone else could have. And there's a group from South Carolina that were like, that were like angels compared to them. But although they treated us bad, but they, they were a lot better than them. I think what made us kind of survive Guantanamo was the fact that we was young. And I think the second thing was because we, I was not there on my own. 
So anything that happened to me, I could relate to somebody that was very close to me. Being best friends from a, from a young age, you know, who else could you want in that kind of situation? We was never charged of any crime, um, never given an explanation of why we was arrested in the first place. The first night I got home, I can remember waking up and sitting in my bed, still thinking that I was in Guantanamo and still waiting for the guard to actually bring me food to my, to my room. After sitting there for about half an hour, I realised I was in my bedroom. So, you know, what am I doing? Sitting there like an idiot. Within a 48 hour period, we were taken up out of a supermax prison and we were walking the streets of London. Why did I get released? I was made to feel like I was the worst of the worst. If I was so bad, why am I here? Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm Asif Mambi again, and uh, Susan and Matthew will be joining me for this reading. Uh, we'll be reading excerpts from the Combatant Status Review Tribunal of Detainee Mustafa alt Ider held in Guantanamo. I'll be reading the part of Mustafa, Susan is reading the part of the Tribunal President, and Matthew is reading the part of the Recorder. Is it your plan to go through each allegation? Yes. Recorder, read each one aloud and then allow the detainee to respond to each allegation. Item 2A1. The detainee is Algerian but acquired Bosnian citizenship by serving in the Bosnian army in 1995. Is this the first accusation? Yes. Uh, as I said to my personal representative earlier, I have some papers that were with me when I was transferred over here. They could not find those papers. The papers proved I was not living in Bosnia in 1995. I acquired the citizenship while living in Croatia in February 1995. I entered Bosnia, if I remember correctly, in July or August, about two or three months before the war ended. I'm going to give you proof. I was living in Croatia. In the year 1995, Croatia divided into two parts, uh, Japania and Dalmatia. I was the martial arts champ in Dalmatia in 1995. The certificate said, that says I won the championship is probably still in my house. It, he even has the date on it. Can we move on to the second point? The detainee is associated with the armed Islamic group GIA. I, I don't uh, want to ask you about the evidence because you said the evidence was classified. If you have any evidence, you can tell me. It, has, it, has, it is no problem. I'm going to tell you if you have any evidence, you can tell that to me. Are you responding to that with either a yes or no? Of course, no. What proves that is if I was, in, if I was with the Algerian armed group, I, 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 would, I would not have been able to go to the Algerian embassy. When my Algerian passport had expired, I had to go to the embassy to renew it. I had to hand in registration papers, which they take and send to the Interior Ministry in Algeria. The Interior Ministry sends those papers to the area where I live in Algeria to verify all the information. So if I had any relationship with an armed group or drugs or weapons or anything, the response to, to the Algerian embassy would not be to register me. I can tell you that I'm not a member of this group. You can contact Algeria and ask them. Let's respond to the next one, 3A3. Item 3A3. GIA is a recognized extremist organization with ties to Al-Qaeda. Well, how can I respond to this? It's not a question and it's not an accusation. You are right. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> Item 3A4. While living in Bosnia, the detainee associated with a known Al-Qaeda operative. Give me his name. I do not know. Well, how can I respond to this? Did you know of anybody that was, member, that was a member of Al-Qaeda? No. No. No? No. I mean, this is something the interrogators told me a long while ago. I asked the interrogators to tell me who was this person. And I could tell you if I might have known this person, but not if the person is a terrorist. I mean, maybe I knew this person as a friend. Maybe it was a person that worked with me. Maybe it was a person that was on my martial arts team. But I, I do not know if this person is Bosnian, Indian, or whatever. If you tell me the name, then I can respond and defend myself against this accusation. We are asking you the questions, and we need you to respond to what is on the unclassified summary. If you say you did not know or you did know anyone that was part of Al-Qaeda, that is the information we need to know. I've only heard of Al-Qaeda after the attacks in the United States. Before that, I had never heard of Al-Qaeda. 
even after I heard of Al-Qaeda, I felt that Al-Qaeda was the Taliban and the Taliban was Al-Qaeda. Then after watching the news, I knew Al-Qaeda was associated with bin Laden and the Taliban was associated with the Afghans. Item 3A5. At the time of his capture, the detainee had planned to travel to Afghanistan once his Al-Qaeda contact arrived there and had made the necessary arrangements. I can respond to this accusation with a question, may I? Please do. Did they find any stamps or visas on my passport to any countries close to Afghanistan? Did they catch me with a suitcase on the plane? Was I seen going to an embassy for one of the countries close to Afghanistan? Was I seen sitting and talking with anyone known to be part of Al-Qaeda? How, how can they know that I planned? I, I don't know how they can do this. Do you have anything that is clear or proves clearly that I planned these things? The answer that I'm able to give you is just to tell you that I did not plan these things, but I do not have any papers or anything to prove that. Item 3B1. The detainee was arrested by Bosnian authorities on 18 October 2001. Yes, but this phrase, arrested by, I just want to make very clear that I was not arrested. I was in my house, and they told me to come with them so they could ask me some questions. Item 3B2. The detainee was arrested because of his involvement with a plan to attack the U.S. Embassy located in Sarajevo. Well, the same answer as before. The only thing I can tell you is I did not plan or, or even think of that. Did you find any explosives on me, any weapons? Did you find me in front of the embassy? Did I threaten anyone? I'm prepared now to tell you if you have anything or any evidence, even if it's just very little, that proves I went to the embassy and looked like that. Detainee made a gesture with his head and neck as if he were looking into a building or a window uh, at the embassy. Then, th then I am ready to be punished. I can, I can just tell you that I did not plan anything. These, accus this, these accusations, my answer to all of them is, I did not do these things, but I do not have anything to prove this. Mustafa, does that conclude your statement? Well, that is it. But I, I was hoping you had evidence that you can give me. If I was in your place and I apologize, in, if I was in your place and I apologize in advance for these words, but if a supervisor came to me and showed me accusations like these, I would take the accusations and I would hit him in the face with them. <laughs> Sorry about that. We had to laugh, but it is okay. I'm a nauseous, angry, and unsettled American citizen. Are you? My name is Laura Murphy, and I'm director of the ACLU Washington Legislative Office. I'm reading an excerpt from a 14-page declaration of Lieutenant Colonel Darrell Vandeveld, Army Reserve Judge Advocate and former lead prosecutor in the military commission case of Guantanamo detainee Mohammed Jawad. Vandeveld removed himself from the case on ethical grounds and submitted this sworn statement in support of Jawad's habeas petition, which was filed by the ACLU. I, Daryl Vandeveld, declare as follows. I am a lieutenant colonel in the Judge Advocate General Corps. Since the September 2001 attacks, I have served in Bosnia, Africa, Iraq, and I Afghanistan. My awards include the Bronze Star Medal, the Iraqi Campaign Medal, and two Joint Meritorious Unit Awards. I offer this declaration in support of Mohammed Jawad's petition for habeas corpus. I was the lead prosecutor assigned to the Military Commission's case against Mr. Jawad until my resignation on September 2008. Initially, the case appeared to be as simple as the street crimes I had prosecuted by the dozens in civilian life but eventually I began to harbor serious doubts about the strength of the evidence. Mr. Jawad was alleged to have thrown a grenade at U.S. troops, but the victims of the attack had not seen the attacker. At least three other Afghans had been arrested for the crime and had subsequently confessed, casting considerable doubt on the claim that Mr. Jawad was solely responsible for the attack. And I learned that the written statement characterized as Jawad's personal confession 
could not possibly have been written by him because Jawad was functionally illiterate and could not read or write. The statement was not even in his native language. I also found evidence that Mr. Jawad had been badly mistreated by U.S. authorities, both in Afghanistan and Guantanamo. Mr. Jawad's prison records referred to a suicide attempt, a suicide which he sought to accomplish by banging his head repeatedly against one of his cell walls. The record reflects 112 unexplained moves from cell to cell over a two-week period, an average of eight moves per day for 14 days. Mr. Jawad had been subjected to a sleep deprivation program known as the Frequent Flyer Program. I lack the words to express the heart sickness I experienced when I came to understand the pointless, purely gratuitous mistreatment of Mr. Jawad by my fellow soldiers. It is my opinion, based on my extensive knowledge of the case, that there is no credible evidence or legal basis to justify Mr. Jawad's detention in U.S. custody or his prosecution by military commission. Holding Mr. Jawad for six years with no resolution of his case and with no terminus in sight is something beyond a travesty. I have taken an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and I remain confident that I have done so, spending over four years of the past seven years away from my family, my home, my civilian occupation, all without any expectation or a desire for any reward greater than the knowledge that I have remained true to my word and have done my level best to rise to our nation's defense in this time of need. I did not quit the military commissions or resign. Instead, I personally petitioned the Army's Judge Advocate General to allow me to serve the remaining six months of my two-year voluntary obligation in Afghanistan or Iraq. In the exercise of his wisdom and his discretion, he permitted me to be released from active duty. However, had I been returned to Afghanistan or Iraq, and had I encountered Muhammad Jawad in either of those hostile lands where two of my friends have been killed in action and another one of my very best friends was terribly wounded, I have no doubt at all, none, that Mr. Jawad would pose any threat whatsoever to me, his former prosecutor, and now repentant persecutor. Six years is long enough for a boy of 16 to serve in virtual solitary confinement in a distant land for reasons he may never fully understand. Mr. Jawad should be released to resume his life in a civil society for his sake and for our own sense of justice and perhaps to restore a measure of our basic humanity. As a postscript, in August 2009, after seven years of illegal detention, Jawad was released home to Afghanistan after a court ruled that there was no credible evidence to, con to continue to hold him. Thank you. I'm Larry Seams. I'm the director of the Freedom to Write and International Programs at Penn American Center. Uh, please join me one more time in thanking our amazing readers. I'd also like to thank you. I'd also like to add my thanks on behalf of Penn to Georgetown Law School and its Human Rights Institute and Center on National Security and Law for hosting us this evening, and to David Cole for helping to make this happen. 
I'd, I'd like to thank, as always, the ACLU, and especially Atika Kaki and my colleague Elizabeth Weinstein at Penn, Weinstein at Penn, who really are the ones who made tonight happen. And finally, a special thanks to Representatives Allison, Scott, and Conyers. Your presence here tonight is incredibly important and deeply appreciated. I just... I would just like to close with one thought and one plea. Although many of the incidents we read about tonight would appear to be in the past, reckoning with these facts is not just a historical exercise. It shapes how we will act, how we will act now and in the future. A few weeks ago, former Vice President Dick Cheney appeared on the Sunday morning interview program this week and was asked whether he believed that Umar Abdul Muttalib, the would-be Christmas Day bomber, should have been subjected to enhanced interrogation techniques, including waterboarding. Cheney answered, the professionals need to make that judgment. We've got people in, we had in our administration, I'm sure many of them are still there, they're career professionals, who are experts in that subject, and they are the ones that you might turn somebody like Abdul Muttalib over to. Let them be the judge of whether or not he's prepared to cooperate and how they can best achieve his cooperation. The thing is, we know from the documents that have been released that those who designed and carried out these so-called enhanced interrogations were not career professionals. In fact, they had no interrogation experience at all. The career professionals, several of whom we heard from this evening and two of whom read with us tonight, objected to these abuses as ineffective, counterproductive, and wrong. We also know the U.S. military warned early on against abusive interrogations. Often, the military warned, interrogators operate from the assumption, often incorrect, that a prisoner possesses information of interest. When the prisoner is not forthcoming, physical and psychological pressures are increased. Eventually, the prisoner will provide answers that they feel the interrogator is seeking. In this instance, the information is neither reliable nor accurate. And we also know that, shockingly, when even the inexperienced interrogators in the field finally judged that enough was enough, enough being 82 sessions of waterboarding in the case of Abu Zubaydah, Officials in Washington flew to the secret CIA prison in Thailand to order them to waterboard him some more. These facts were first documented by the CIA's Inspector General in 2004 and are surely well known to Mr. Cheney. The only reason he is not forced to acknowledge them is that not, of us, not enough of us know what he knows. As Jamil said at the beginning of the program, accountability begins at home. As writers, many of us at Penn believe that we have an important role to play in helping to bring the facts to light. But it is really our role as citizens that compels us to seek the truth. Thanks largely to the ACLU, the record of abuse is now available to all of us. And so here are three things that all of us can do to help this country reckon with torture. You all received the postcard. First one is write a letter to the Attorney General asking him to follow the evidence and apply the law to those who authorized and facilitated torture. There's a sample letter on the pen table outside if you're interested. Second, hold your own reckoning with torture event. The script for tonight's event is available online at www.aclu.org slash reckoning and pen.org slash reckoning. Download it stage a reading in your, a, a, an event of your own in your own community or even in your own home. It is so crucial to speak and to hear these words. And finally, keep up with and keep examining the evidence for yourself. Read the account of the torture program that's unfolding at thetorturereport.org and use the site's database to delve into the formerly secret documents yourself and share what you discover with your friends, your colleagues, your community, and with us. Again, thank you all so much for coming tonight. <laughs>